Hello, everybody. Welcome in. I'm so glad you are here joining us for the parent chat. We've only got a couple left this year, but um, tonight is one that if you're a parent who's dealing with anxiety and school refusal, that you are going to be very happy that you are here. Um, this is something that pre-pandemic there was a lot of, but with the pandemic and post, there is so much more school avoidance. And I know for parents, it's really hard to navigate and to understand how to, to push and how to release and all of those things. So we have an expert tonight that's going to help us. Um, as a reminder, though, I just wanted to let you know that the parent chats are funded by the Lake Washington School Foundation. So we're very happy that we're able to provide this. And I'm Coach Sherry, if you haven't joined us before, uh, I'm doing this as a volunteer role because I really believe in the mission of bringing mental health information to parents so that you can turn around and support your kiddos. So tonight we have a Madison Fail here with us and um, I'm going to just listen in, maybe jump in with a question or two, but we will have time for questions at the end. So if you have questions, please put those in the Q&A box so they don't get lost in the chat box. As we go, feel free to chat away in the chat box um, things that are aha moments or things that are coming up for you. And, um, you know, it's just a way to connect with others who are here and to let us know what you're thinking as well. And to warm up the chat box, I'd love for you to pop in and tell us the ages of your kids. That helps us to kind of know who's here tonight and to make sure that we can best serve you. So I would love to um, welcome Madison onto the screen and um, let's get started. Thanks, Sherry. Um, I'll go ahead and share my screen and we'll get started. Thank you so much for being here. And why don't you tell um, them a little bit about yourself before we, we jump into all the great information you have. Absolutely, totally. Um, so my name's Madison File. Um, I'm a child psychologist. I currently work in a private practice. Um, my sort of area of specialization is working with depressed and anxious teens and their families. And so this specific topic of school avoidance is definitely something that touches like so many of the families that I work with, working with that age group. Um, so I do mostly work with middle and high school students, but I do know that there might be parents here who have younger kids. So I'm trying to cover all those ages. And I think this is an issue that definitely comes up in those elementary years as well. And a lot of the issues we might see as school avoidance later on, they kind of start during those earlier years too. So I'll try and kind of um, be as broad as possible. Um, it's definitely a topic I could say a lot on. So I wanted to kind of like keep this more narrow. And since this is for parents, I really want to focus on these like parent-based approaches. So like what can parents do even when their kids maybe aren't as motivated or as engaged um, in treatment? So that's a little bit of what I'm going to be talking about. And I will save some time for a question and answer at the end so we can um, talk about scenarios or things that maybe are coming up for folks who are here with us. Great. Yeah, and um, even though we'll, we'll take the questions at the end, you can put them in the Q&A box at any time because that kind of keeps it in a little box for us and doesn't get lost. So don't feel like you need to wait until the end to put those in there. Um, you can go ahead and, and pop them in. All right, I'm going to go off screen and just hand it over to you. OK, sounds great. Thank you so much. All right, so let's get into this. So Sherry mentioned this, um, some of the broader context of this issue. This headline here is from a New York Times article um, that came out last month talking about this like increase in kids, kids who are chronically absent from school. So um, they basically showed that since the pandemic, this amount of kids who are chronically absent has basically doubled. So I think this really highlights that um, while there's like this has always been an issue for some kids, we really are experiencing like a pretty big change generationally right now and how many kids it's impacting. So uh, if you're hearing this talk today because you're struggling with figuring out like how to get your kids to go to school and help them feel strong and confident at school, you are definitely not alone. It's touching a lot of people. And sure, some of this shift might be in this like perception that maybe being physically in school isn't as important anymore as it used to be. Um, and that might be true, you know, for some kids who are missing school here and there more um, for different reasons. But for kids who have underlying anxiety that's really driving these absences, um, this is a really slippery slope. And some of the flexibility that schools have adopted after the pandemic, um, you know, might actually be doing some of these anxious kids a disservice um, in particular. So we're going to get into that piece. Um, 
So what causes school anxiety and avoidance? I'm only gonna say one thing about this. Um, it's not parents. So we can all have like a little sigh of relief. Um, the truth is that psychology and the science we have hasn't really been able to tell us that much about why some kids have problems with anxiety and others don't and why some develop these behaviors while others don't. It's likely a mix of some genetic factors, some temperament um, mixed with environmental things. However, we really don't have any reason to believe that parents are making their kids anxious or causing them to avoid school or do those things. Um, so beyond that, it's something that has a really big impact on parents. And I know it can be really extremely stressful for parents when they're dealing with this. And parents can feel like a lot of guilt and a lot of pressure around trying to make sure their kid is getting to school, is feeling good in school. So when I go on to talk about these parent-based treatments and approaches for child anxiety, I really don't want anyone to think that I'm implying that parents cause child anxiety. It just means that you know parents are really important people in their kids' lives and they can have a big impact in helping them learn to cope with anxiety. So when we talk about school, um, anxiety and avoidance, what are we seeing? Like what are parents seeing at home and what are teachers seeing at school? Um, we can see at school, this could be like a lot of concentration and academic difficulties, right? So if a kid is at school and they're really dealing with a lot of anxiety, they might have a hard time focusing on the actual schoolwork. So they might be falling behind because they have anxiety. They might be really anxious to speak in class. So Teachers might talk about them not participating or even going as far as um, what we would call selective mutism, which is not speaking at all in the class setting. Um, especially for younger kids, we'll sometimes see outbur outbursts and behavior problems that are related to the anxiety. The kids are just feeling so uncomfortable at school that it's coming out um, as sort of dysregulated behavior. Um, when kids are sort of middle school, high school ages, we can sometimes see a lot of um, texting parents throughout the day, trying to be in contact with parents to get reassur reassurance or maybe to try and convince them to come pick them up from school if they need to. Um, kids leaving class often, so taking lots of breaks to go to the bathroom, using the sort of safe spaces at school like the counselor's office and things like that to spend a lot of time outside of class. And, you know, um, in the high school years, we'll see just skipping classes might be um, specific classes that have a lot of anxiety or unwanted situations for them. And then leaving school early is another one. At home for these kids, we hear a lot of physical complaints. So complaints about headaches, about stomach aches, um, sleep problems. I didn't sleep at all last night. I can't go to school. So they're feeling anxious that can contribute to those physical things. And then those physical complaints can also be functional in helping them to like avoid school or get out of going to school. So that's really common. Something I hear a lot from parents is like, I can't get my kid out of bed in the morning. They're like basically catatonic. They're not responding to me. Um, and I, I can't get them to school. I can't get them out of bed. They're incredibly hard to rouse. Um, we see a lot of pleading and negotiating, sort of crying, meltdown, sort of typical behavior, um, trying to convince their parents to either to let them stay home from school or to come pick them up early from school. We might see kids asking for sort of strategic absences, so wanting to avoid specific scenarios like presentations at school, um, field trips, specific classes where um, they know that they're gonna be asked to do certain things that are, you know, anxiety triggers for them. And then a lot of kids are getting to school late. So there's a lot of struggle in the morning. And so they're missing maybe consistently the first couple of classes, or if, um, you know, they're elementary school, they're missing that first chunk of the day. And on sort of the more extreme end, we can see verbal or physical aggression. So these sort of behaviors getting more and more extreme to kind of um, get parents to back off on the pressure. And sometimes we'll see threats of harm to self or others. So um, threats of suicide are sometimes something that will come up in kind of more um, extreme situations. So, um, you know, kids who are dealing with this, they might only have one of these behaviors. You know, maybe they're only hard to get up in the morning, but then they're fine at school. 
um, or they might have a lot of the in-school anxiety, but their attendance is actually fine. Maybe they're so anxious that they're nervous about missing school, um, but when they're at school, they're white knuckling it and they're just having a pretty um, terrible time of it while they're in school. I'm gonna be kind of focusing on kids who have a mix of the anxiety and avoidance, um, but definitely it's possible to see kind of like any mix of these things. And when I talk to parents who are feeling frustrated or worried, they're usually talking to me about these behaviors um, that they're really worried about. But underneath these behaviors, there can be a lot of different factors that are at play there. Um, so I wanna talk about that for sure. Um, what, what are the reasons that kids are avoiding? When I talk to kids, um, they're talking about these things, right? So not surprisingly, a lot of it is about avoiding negative things at school, things that they don't like. Um, for younger kids, separation anxiety is really common. They don't want to be away from their parents. So the fear might not even be so much about what's at school, but it's about being away from their caregiver and that time of um, separation, like when you're dropping the kid off or when they're going into the school building, that tends to be like the toughest point for kids who have the separation anxiety. Um, there's a number of social situations that kids might be worried about at school. Um, Speaking in class, like I mentioned, is a big one. Um, wanting to avoid any um, sort of like performance that they might have to do in class. Um, bullying, you know, this isn't necessarily social anxiety, but some kids really are facing bullying at school or they might have a fear of bullying um, that's coming up. Um, this one I actually hear about a lot. It's not necessarily anxiety in the classic sense that we would think of, but a lot of kids feel really lonely at school. They feel disconnected. I can learn a lot about a kid by asking them like, you know, what is lunchtime like for you? Do you have anybody to sit with? Are you eating lunch in the bathroom, right? If kids are feeling really disconnected or uncomfortable socially, that's gonna make school a pretty uncomfortable place to be. And that's can often be a driving reason they might avoid school. Um, conflict with friends. So sometimes something as simple as having a falling out with a friend group or an awkward situation for a friend group could make a kid want to avoid being at school. And sometimes I even hear um, there are certain teachers that kids are having trouble with. So they might be strategically missing or avoiding certain classes because they perceive that a teacher doesn't like them or has called them out in some way. So sometimes um, conflict with teachers can also be a reason that kids are avoiding. Academic struggles for sure. So just like anxiety can cause issues with academics, if someone is struggling to keep up or they're feeling really overwhelmed in class, they might start to feel really anxious. And if they're falling behind, they might feel even more anxious to go into that class and to face that teacher and have to deal with that. Um, on the flip side, some kids have a lot of perfectionism. So they might alternate between feeling really, really anxious about their schoolwork and is it good enough and wanting to avoid situations where they feel like they can't be good enough or there might be a fear of failure. So that comes up sometimes. And then there's like this whole host of specific fears kids might have that are present in the school setting. So they might be afraid of crowds or being around a lot of people. They might have a fear of illness. Um, I have vomit on this slide, which seems maybe kind of niche, but you'd be surprised a lot of kids have a fear of um, vomiting in public or seeing other kids vomit, which surprisingly does happen a lot in schools. So that can make it kind of like a scary place to be. And then other safety concerns. So, you know, we see on TV all the time um, situations where kids might like feel scared or uncomfortable about what might happen at school. Um, so these things are all reasons kids might not like to be at school. Um, just as important, I think, is thinking about what does avoiding school give kids access to that are positive? Um, a big one is like more leisure time at home, more unsupervised time, right? There's a lot of demands at them at school. And if they can get out of that, they're at home and all of a sudden they have all the time in the world to do whatever they want in a more relaxed way. Um, you know, I ask kids, what are you doing at home when you're not at school? And they're like, nothing, I'm not doing anything. I'm just hanging out. 
I don't think you're just staring at a wall. Like, what are you doing? And what it turns out they're usually doing is they're in bed, they're on their phone, they're on the internet, they're chatting with friends. If you dig sometimes, you know, maybe they are actually talking to people who are in a different time zone or in a different country. And so being at home during the day gives them access to um, chatting with those people or being involved in certain things online that they wouldn't be able to if they were in school. Um, Parent attention, this is a big one, especially with younger kids. Um, if they are getting to spend the day with their caregiver, sometimes this goes around along with separation anxiety, that's a lot of attention that they get that they wouldn't if they were at school from their parents. Um, I've also seen this come up with um, older kids and teens. Sometimes actually the fight about school can be a way to get parental attention. I had a case where um, this kid had been avoiding school. We got her back in school. She was doing really well. She actually said that she enjoyed school. She liked being there, but her and her mom were still having these conflicts every day before school and she would end up going to school. So we were like, huh, what's going on here? Um, what's the function of this fighting about school? And it turned out um, mom was super busy with other kids who had high needs and with work. And so this time where they were sort of like fighting in the morning was one way that mom was communicating to her, like, you're a priority, I care about you. And so that fighting had actually become um, a positive, like, attention that that kid was getting. So I think um, this is something to keep in mind, especially if there is a lot of conflict um, between parents and kids. And lastly, sleep. I think that's an important one. A lot of kids are really sleep deprived, especially teenagers. I hear this a lot, like, I just can't get out of bed in the morning because I need to sleep. And so kids can actually, their schedules can get so off if they're chronically late for school and they're sleeping in, they're staying home and sleeping more. That can throw off everything where they are really feeling uh, pretty bad in the morning because they haven't been sleeping. Oh, I'm gonna go back for a second. So, um, you know, I think understanding this, this is like a ton of things that could be underneath the same behavior of avoiding school, not wanting to be in school. Uh, so understanding for your child, what are the factors going on? That's really important and figuring out how to help them best. Um, if you feel like you already know what's at play for your kid, um, that's great. If you don't, it's worth having sort of an open conversation with them about it and trying to maybe dig a little bit more into what is school actually like for them? How do they move throughout the day? What makes it enjoyable or not enjoyable. Sometimes it can be hard to figure all this out on your own. Um, you know, child psychologists or other behavioral specialists are really great at this, like trying to figure out what are all these factors. So if you're feeling at a loss, I do think getting kind of more in-depth assessment of your situation can be a really helpful sort of first step for folks. Another important piece to understand is this sort of like cycle of anxiety and how avoidance and anxiety fuel each other over time. So a kid can start out with anxiety. Like I said, we don't really know why some kids have problems with anxiety, but they do, right? So say they have social fears or um, they're having stress around academics, um, that makes school uncomfortable, so they want to avoid it. And when they do avoid it, great for that moment. Um, but over time, these issues kind of pile up. The next time they're in school, they're actually more socially isolated or more on the outside of things. They're more behind in, in their academics, so they feel worse and more anxious, which makes them want to avoid more. Um, and this is really true for all anxiety, right? If we have something in particular that we're afraid of, avoiding it can make us feel less anxious in the short term, but in the long term, we're having fewer opportunities to be exposed to the thing we're afraid of and learn that it's not that bad, right? And to actually have our anxiety decrease over time. Um, unfortunately, as this cycle goes on, not only does the anxiety get worse and there's more of these negative outcomes, um, it can really have a big impact on kids' self-esteem. They start to feel less capable. Um, they start to feel like they don't necessarily belong and their world might sort of start to shrink a bit. And we can also see depression kind of coming in um, secondary to anxiety and being out of school and being disconnected. And in addition to that, you know, there can be a lot of parent-child conflict as parents are really trying to push and figure out how to get their kid in school. It can create a lot of tension. So, um, so yeah, just as it goes on, we want to we want to make sure we're intervening as as quick as we can to kind of stop this. Um, 
And I think what kids with anxiety really need is not to avoid the situations, right, that make them anxious, but to actually get lots of practice being in those situations that make them uncomfortable so that they can learn that they actually can cope. And when kids start to break this cycle, they do start to feel really great about themselves, right? They start to feel more capable, more positive and excited about exploring the world. So um, I'm going to start talking now about, okay, how do we actually disrupt to this cycle? Um, so as I said, most of the solutions I'm going to talk about are parent-based approaches. Um, however, I want to briefly mention the child-focused approaches that are supported by research. Um, so first off, these aren't even like, you know, therapy approaches, just like your first step as a parent, which is probably most parents' um, instinct, right, is to kind of collaborate with your child and problem solve. So if there are concrete things you can do, like they're behind in class, maybe helping them figure out how to get caught up, right? That could be um, something that is sort of practical that you can help them overcome. Great do that, right? Work with the school if there's concerns that need to be addressed by the school. So for example, you know, if there is an issue with bullying, or maybe they need more personalized attention in class to get them caught up, um, working with the school to address that is great. Um, beyond those, um, cognitive behavior therapy is sort of the most, um, most, uh, scientifically supported treatment for child anxiety that we have right now. So it's it's child focused in that it's the child that's in the therapy um, and it focuses on challenging their fears, kind of learning coping techniques. And then the really important part is that exposure, right? Finding ways to approach the things that, um, that they're afraid of and to learn to cope in that moment. These are really great. This approach is really great for addressing those underlying anxieties, right? If your kid has social phobia or social phobia or is afraid of specific things, um, if we, if they are able to work on that, it might make school uh, less uncomfortable so they're able to go more. However, the child really has to be willing to participate in that, right? They have to be willing to put themselves in situations that are scary and tough. Um, and often like kids just, they aren't there or they're not there on their own. Um, and in addition to this, um, last one for child-focused approaches is, um, you know, medications like, in particular, SSRIs are evidence-based um, for treating child anxiety as well. But to get back to this question, like, what if the child is not motivated to make the change? What can parents do sort of all on their own to help? Um, before we get into that, though, we're going to have a little reality check moment, which is what can't parents do, right? What do parents not have control over? Parents cannot control their child's feelings, right? So as much as we would like to be able to turn off our child's anxiety or um, talk them out of the fears they have or explain why they don't need to be afraid of the things that they're afraid of, those don't tend to work, right? We are um, trying to change things that ultimately are not within our control. We also can't talk our child into feeling motivated or excited for school. You know, we can do a lot of uh, motivational speaking. And for the most part, even if our kid is saying, yeah, I'm motivated, I'm on board, that tends to not really translate into the kind of behavioral change that we're really looking for. Um, and at the end of the day, we can't make our children change their behaviors and we cannot make them go to school. Right. Unless you have a child that you can physically put in your car, which some of you might physically put in your car and then physically get taken to the school and leave them in the school. Um, we cannot make them go to school. And I want to focus on this. I put this slide here because I think parents do feel extreme pressure to be able to do these things. Right. They feel like they should be able to get their kids to school. They should be able to convince them that um, school is a safe place. It's a good place. Um, that it's important that they be there and that they do their work. Um, and yet, ultimately, our child's feelings, thoughts, and behaviors are not fully in our control. So this slide is not here to make you feel powerless, but hopefully to free you of feeling responsible or guilty or like a failure if you haven't been able to change these things through just pure force of will. Um, 
none of the things that I'm going to talk about next will require any active participation from your child. You can do them whether your child is on board or not. And they focus on the things that parents do have control over. Um, oops. Yeah. Um, which are your words, your actions, and your resources. Um, I'll go back a second to address this, which is when we try and control these things, right? That's when we get in this feeling of power struggle, right? We are struggling against our kids and we feel like um, we are trying to force them or change them in some way. Usually when we end up in this sort of power struggle, we're not gonna win, but we can focus on these things that we do have control over. So let's get into it. So first one, we can change, you can change the way that you communicate in order to reduce that power struggle. So what that looks like is instead of trying to change their thoughts and feelings about school, right? Maybe they think school is stupid. Maybe they think it's not important. Maybe they, uh, yeah, maybe they think it's, being at school kind of sucks. We can, instead of trying to convince them that those things aren't true, we can validate that. So what that sounds like is like, yeah, I hear that you're having a really hard time in school right now. It's not a fun place for you to be, right? And really letting them know that we're we're hearing the struggle and how difficult it is for them and not pushing back against those feelings that they feel. We can approach conversations about school in curious mode instead of fix it mode. So a lot of kids will tell me like, oh, my parents don't really understand. If I talk to them about what's happening, they just, um, they just want to fix it. And so that fix it mode, that's so natural for parents, right? They just want to go in, I'm going to make everything better for you. Um, to kids that often feels like my parent doesn't understand or they're not listening to me. So if a kid is saying, uh, school sucks, instead of trying to fix it right away, really taking the time to be curious and ask them like, what's making it hard for you? What's it like for you to be in school and to be really open to the things that they are going to tell you. And then acknowledging ultimately that it is their choice whether they attend school. So sort of letting go of some of that struggle and that resistance. Um, so a lot of times when I talk about this, parents will be like, uh, I feel kind of scared. This makes me feel kind of tense because for a lot of parents who are at this point with their kids, it can feel like if I'm not pushing them verbally or reminding them or cajoling them, things are going to get worse. So we keep pushing our kids to change their perspective on things, um, trying to motivate them. But in a way, that's actually making them dig in their heel more while our relationship with them is getting more and more strained. So it's sort of like one of these finger trap things, right? The more we pull for change, the more our kid is going to dig in and resist. So by reducing the pressure in our communication, we're giving space for our child to feel heard and be able to share more with us. Um, and we have other strategies that we can use to create that pressure and that motivation. So we're going to let the next two things I'm going to talk about, which are behavioral strategies, generate the motivation. And then you can continue to just use your words to be like the supportive, caring parent that you are. Um, before we go to that, though, if this strategy in particular of communication and how to talk to your kid is something that you feel like you could use more help with, this is a book recommendation I have. This is like classic. Uh, this book's been around for a while, sold many copies, and that's because it um, it truly is a classic. The How to Talk So Kids Will Listen, and then there's the teen version, um, covers a lot of like really specific scenarios around communicating with your kids. Um, in more supportive ways. So these are definitely recommendations as like first places to go on this topic in particular. Okay, moving on. So the next piece we're talking about behavioral strategies is to reduce your accommodation of avoidance. So what do I mean when I say accommodation? Accommodations are changes parents make to help a child avoid or reduce their anxious feelings. So accommodations are a natural and normal result of having an anxious child. It's the most natural thing in the world for a parent to want to come in and make their kid feel better or to help them in that moment when they're feeling really anxious. Um, typically, these start out as small ways that you're helping a child feel less anxious. But over time, as that cycle of anxiety and avoidance 
continues, these can kind of become routines that a child relies on to help them avoid those anxious situations and feelings. So these are sort of like the training wheels on the bike, right? At first they're helpful or they're helpful if they're part of a transition to more independence, but if they become part of a routine, they're actually getting in the way of that kid learning to ride their bike independently. So this strategy is really all about identifying your involvement in your child's avoidance routines and then changing them. So some examples for that show up in school anxiety and avoidance are things like asking teachers not to call on your child in class or kind of getting special permission so that your kid can avoid situations in class that make them anxious. Um, maybe intervening in school to prevent natural consequences of being behind or things like that, or of being out of class even. Providing lots of reassurance or contact during the school day is a common one. Um, accommodating sort of atypical drop off or pick up requests, so dropping off at school later or picking up early from school. And then um, changing your work and other schedules in order to accommodate them staying at home. Um, so what does it look like to change these? Um, I want to talk about one clinical example from my own work. Um, I had a um, uh, a daughter and dad pair that I was working with where the daughter would feel really anxious during math class and she would start texting her dad and saying, I'm anxious, I'm having an anxiety attack. And he would try and coach her through it and provide reassurance, but it would pretty much always escalate. Um, and it would escalate to the point where she would have to leave the class and would be begging him to come pick her up. And then he would come pick her up. And it actually got to the point where she was talking about um, having thoughts of suicide at school. And of course, he was really um, worried about that, kind of freaked out by that. So he even more would come and pick her up if that was the case. So we talked about this situation uh, and sort of broke it down. We identified the accommodations that dad was doing were um, being in contact and providing reassurance throughout the day and then picking her up from school early. So what we did is we made a plan, like what would it look like to to remove those accommodations and not do that. And so we made a plan and we communicated it to the daughter. And the plan was if she starts to feel anxious in math class, she can she can text dad. She can do whatever she wants, right? Because we are not in control of her behaviors. I can't tell her not to do that. Um, but if he received a text from her, his plan was to send one supportive message reminding her of the safety plan we'd made for the school. We had collaborated with the counselor so that she could go talk to the counselor if she needed and the counselor knew um, that she might be having thoughts of suicide. So we'd kind of made it like a safety plan um, and that he would under no circumstances pick her up from school early unless a school staff member requested that he do that. And so we communicated that plan to her and let her know and then he followed through with it. Um, she definitely tested it, right? She sent some messages, saw what, what his response was, but as soon as she kind of realized, okay, this is going to be the consistent new response, um, she was actually able to then stay in math class and tolerate that anxiety. And it gave her opportunity to kind of learn, oh, I actually, I can cope and I can find other ways to deal with this anxiety in class and get through it. Um, so that's just a little example of how you can like identify those accommodations and make a plan to reduce it and then execute it. Um, so a couple of things on accommodation though, this um, does not mean not helping your kid. So like saying, oh, you're totally on your own. You have to deal with school and you have to deal with your anxiety on your own, right? The difference is shifting from how can I help you avoid things that make you feel anxious to how can I help you get to school on time and stay in school, right? I want to do the things that will help you to achieve that goal. Um, Another example of this might be, I'm not gonna be available to drive you to school late in the day anymore, right? Because I wanna focus on helping you get to school on time. Is there anything I can do to make that happen? Can I make you breakfast so that you're ready and up to get to school? Some accommodations um, may be appropriate if they're sort of stepping stones towards increasing your child's ability to cope. So for example, maybe going with them to talk to a teacher if they're worried about that or allowing a certain number of check-ins during the day, if these are things that are helping you move in the right direction. So helping them gain sort of more independence and to be at school more successfully. Um, so one way to kind of think about your accommodations and to 
figure out what yours are is ask yourself, what would I be doing differently if my child did not have a problem with school anxiety or avoidance? So basically like what, what of my behaviors have changed because my child is anxious or has this avoidance? Um, so if this is interesting to you, if you want to know more about this strategy, this is a book I highly recommend. This is a um, therapy approach called Space, Supportive Parenting for Anxious Childhood Emotions. And this is like the child, um, this is like the parent self-help um, book for it, Breaking Free of Child Anxiety. This, um, focus, this treatment focuses only on the supportive communication that we talked about before and this strategy of reducing accommodations. And it's been found recently to be as effective as child-focused CBT at addressing childhood anxiety, which I think is really cool. So just parents changing their behavior can have a huge impact on kids' anxiety. Okay, so with the last strategy, we were focusing on making it harder for your child to avoid school and things that make them anxious. With this next strategy, we are actually trying to make it more appealing for them to go. How do we add some incentives. So the framework that I like to use for thinking about this sort of strategy is that, you know, attending school is a child's job, except it's a job where they can never get fired, um, which for adults, you know, you think about it on the days that you really don't want to get out of bed and you really don't want to go to work. A big motivator on those days is I don't want to get fired. I want to keep my job. But for kids, that aspect is missing, right? So you can kind of think of this like, imagine if you had a job that you really didn't enjoy that much, or you didn't like your coworkers or your boss, you didn't really feel that connected or important there at work. Um, and then one day HR sends out a new policy, which is that no one can ever get fired. And on top of that, you'll actually get paid the same amount whether you show up or not. In this scenario, what do you think your attendance might look like, right? It might kind of start to look like that graph we had at the at the beginning, right, where 25% of people are chronically absent. So now if we switch it up a little bit, like you're not the employee anymore, you're actually the head of HR at the same company. Uh, because essentially, like if school is your child's job, then as a parent, that's what you are, right? Like your HR, and it's your job to start issuing new policies to get your kids to show up for their job. So the first thing you would probably do is to set some really clear expectations, right? What are your expectations for attendance? This can really vary um, from kid to kid, right? It might be that if your kid is really struggling to attend school, this is at first just like, you're gonna get up and we're gonna get in the car and we're gonna drive to the school building every day. And that's like our first step and that's what we're gonna expect. For other kids, it might be, I we expect you to be in all of your classes all day. Um, and to start tracking, right? Because if you're HR, you want to make sure that you're paying attention and you're tracking and you have a realistic picture of what's really happening right now. Um, kids are also really good at knowing when their parents have stopped paying attention. I find this is true with teens in particular. They know when their parents are checking their attendance or checking um, their schoolwork and things like that. So make sure that you are staying on top of it. And then you would want to set up some incentives ahead of time, right? You would not want these to be punishments where they're randomly doled out when things aren't going as planned. You would want them to know, okay, this is what the incentive is. This is what you get paid essentially for showing up for your job. So we'd want to change that policy, right? Of kids getting paid the same, whether they show up or not. Um, so what is the pay? What does, what do kids earn? This is where I think parents get stuck a lot of the time because they don't like this idea of taking things away from the kids, or it kind of feels like, am I punishing my kid for having anxiety? But I really encourage parents to start to think of these things like access to phone, internet, video games, transportation, the car, right? Preferred clothes, food, activities. These are resources that you are in control of as a parent. And so they are really are, um, a really good sort of bargaining tool or leverage to add motivation for your kids to get to school. All of these things technically are extras, right? They're bonuses. They're not things that you are required to provide as a parent. Um, so if you can switch that a little bit where it's not a consequence of these being taken away, it's actually going to school and meeting the expectations that we've set. That is, um, these are the things that you earn through meeting those expectations that have been set. Um, 
this is, I know parents like can feel really uncomfortable trying to implement some of these things. There's a lot of really big behaviors that come up when parents are trying to set limits on things like this with their kids. And so that's another situation where I think, you know, having a psychologist or a therapist or a behavioral specialist or somebody who does this parent training work, um, support you through it can be really, really helpful, right? To help you set up a plan, help you implement it and help you deal with whatever, whatever happens afterwards. Um, and again, I think sometimes having this clear, um, behavioral plan ahead of time is actually helpful because it takes the emotion out of it a little bit, right? So I said ahead of time, not in the heat of the moment. So this isn't coming from a place of I'm mad at you for not going to school, so I'm taking your phone. We're doing it from a place of like, yeah, I totally get that you want your phone and I totally get that school's not an easy place for you to be right now. And I also have confidence that you can handle a tough decision like this, like you are going to be able to figure it out. Um, and then is there anything I can do to help you meet that expectation, right? Is there any additional support I can give in meeting the expectation, not avoiding? Um, you can also add like bonuses, right? Things that, um, kids can earn that are additional to sort of what they would consider like the basic things that they like to have, right? Their internet access and things like that, um, that are like extra motivating. So that can be helpful too. And then the last part is like the hardest part, which is following through. So following through with um, those sort of consequences or incentives, because you're going to have to kind of expect some pushback, right? Um, they're probably going to test you to see if you're serious and if you're going to be consistent with this. Um, I have a one-year-old at home, and I think the like absolute best metaphor for setting limits like this is the metaphor of the baby gate, right? If you have a... Uh, kid, a, a toddler who's running around, and all of a sudden you put up a baby gate to an area that they used to be able to go to, um, what do we expect to have happen? We expect that baby to go over and shake that gate as much as they can. And that's a totally natural response, right? And we don't expect, we should expect our kids to do the same thing when we set new limits. Um, we can't blame them for giving it their best go, right? But from sometimes I hear from parents like, oh, I can't take their phone away because they get really upset. Well, that's sort of like saying, you know, I can't put the baby gate up because the baby shakes it. Um, we need to be as parents, the, the gate that won't fall down, right? To hold that consistent thing so that they can have that learning and then move on and say, okay, this is a situation. Let me now figure out how to get myself to school even though I'm feeling anxious, right? Um, because there's this new motivation to do so. Okay. Um, there's a lot I could say about this. Like I said, if you're feeling like you need more support on this, I think having a therapist or behavior specialist to work with you on it um, can be super helpful. If you want to do more reading about this technique in particular, um, the type of therapy that this is from, well, one of them is um, called parent management training. So that's also something you can search if you're looking for providers to help you with this. This is a good self-help book, The Kasdan Method for Parenting the Defiant Child. A little outdated in the, the title, but all the information in it is really um, good in there. Okay. So I'm almost wrapping up. Those are sort of our three strategies just to reiterate and talk about like more some common challenges and pitfalls that parents fall into. Like this is really, really hard stuff. It's hard to do. Um, there's like so many different facets to this, this problem of anxiety and avoidance. Um, so I think like kind of just knowing that and giving yourself a break if it's something you're struggling with. Um, Managing your own emotions as a parent can be really difficult. This is super triggering for a lot of people to deal with. Our kids know what our buttons are, what buttons to press. So it can be um, a really uh, emotional topic. So stepping away as much as you need to. If you have a partner that you're co-parenting with, like taking turns, um, if you just need to tap out and dealing with some of these behaviors, getting help, getting that extra support, and then just giving yourself some grace when you need it. Um, I think overcoming fear, fear a lot of times of the situation becoming worse. I am, um, and then guilt and shame around the fact that this was something maybe your family is struggling with. So in terms of fear of things getting worse, I will, all I'll say about that is I would, 
um, a lot of times these issues with avoidance, they naturally get worse over time if nothing is done. And I would rather um, things get worse for a little bit because you're trying something new than for them to get worse over time because you don't feel like you can do anything or you're feeling powerless. So hopefully this presentation is giving you some ideas about things you might be able to try. Um, staying consistent is really, really hard with this stuff. Um, and it's possible that like, you know, a lot of parents are really overburdened. Maybe they're dealing with other kids with other needs. There's things that are higher up on the priority list. So maybe you need more support to be able to make these consistent changes. Maybe um, you need to call in some help from your partners or community to be able to support you in this. Um, and then expecting one change to fix everything, right? This is like a long process. So if you're in the middle of this, I would just say like, keep at it, try new things, get creative and get that extra support if you feel like you need it. Um, I have a lot of resources here. Um, basically, I think Seattle Children's resource page has a lot of good information. They have a lot of online video resources. Um, they also run school avoidance and parent behavior management groups. Um, so if you're interested in that, I would check out Seattle Children's. Um, you do need a referral from a primary care provider for these, just so you know. Um, if you're looking for a provider who does this sort of parent-based work, um, a good way to, a good place to start is the Washington Mental Health Referral Service. You can call them, tell them what you're looking for, and they'll get back to you with some providers to start with. This is like a much better place to start usually than like a psychology today listing. And then in preparation for this talk, I actually reached out to some of my networks I'm in to see who sort of self-identified as doing this type of work. So I put together a local provider referral list that's at my website. So drmadisonfile.com slash referrals. You can find that there. So that's like a list of people who said that they do this um, parent training work for this um, issue of school avoidance in particular. So another place to start if you're looking for providers. Um, and then some books, these were the same ones I mentioned earlier, and then some additional ones. So Helping Your Anxious Child, a step-by-step -step guide for parents. That's a self-help guide that's um, based in CBT, which I talked about. And then if you are working with teenagers um, and want more help on that behavior management piece, Your Defiant Teen, 10 Steps to Resolve Conflict and Rebuild Your Relationship, I think is a really great resource um, on that topic in particular. Okay, um, I tried to leave time for questions. Hopefully we can get to them if, if some came up. My website is here. You can contact me with follow-up questions. I really want to be a resource for the community. Um, so hopefully I can help point you in the right direction at least if you have questions or you're looking for providers or you're feeling stuck, please feel free to reach out to me. Definitely. Thank you. Thank you. And we do have time for a couple of questions, which is great because we have a couple of questions. Okay. I do want to say first, like, I really appreciate you doing this talk because a lot of parents kind of talk to friends and peers about what's going on. And there's a lot of people who are like, well, just get, you know, get like in control of it and so that kind of brings on like you're talking about the shame and the guilt of it and um so it's really important to reach out to the professionals who are dealing with us who can give you the tried and true um means and techniques to help your child with school avoidance so i appreciate you giving us some of this this um starter information so let me give you one of the questions um, which is a really good one, actually. And this is one that I know a lot of parents do struggle with when they recognize their kids need support and their kids not so keen on getting it. So the question is, how do you get a teen to attend a therapy session to discuss their anxiety when they refuse to go? Great question. So hopefully you got some from my presentation that that would be like ideal. That would be awesome, right? If they were ready to go and to to talk all about this, um, but your kid might not be there, right? And I think that's that's okay. That's a little bit of that like releasing what we don't have full control over. And so I think a good place to start if you're feeling that way is like these strategies that I was talking about. You know, I think when we think about getting help for our anxious kid, we picture our kid going to therapy and talking to a therapist and getting help that way, right? But what we're learning through the research is parents can do these strategies on their own without their kid even having to go into the therapy room. They can meet with a therapist and talk through these things and it can have just a big effect. So I would say 
if you can kind of focus on those things first. And then I think, you know, um, if you really do want your kid to be in therapy, if you're invested in that, trying to keep it um, as as least focused on that outcome that you want as possible, right? So it's not about, oh, I want you to go talk to the therapist to talk about your anxiety so you can go to school, right? You can say, I want you to have somebody to talk to um, and you can talk to them about whatever you want. It's your space. Um, I don't have any investment in the outcome of it. It's just for you. And so kind of maybe presenting it to them as an option like that. And if they are over 13, you can also let them know that in Washington state, if you're over 13 and you're in therapy, your therapist actually like can't talk to your parents about what's going on if you don't want them to. So they actually do have like a lot of protections if they want that to be a space that's just for them. So maybe kind of letting them know that. Um, I think a lot of times when parents suggest hey, do you want to see a therapist? Kids kind of know, oh, I know what your agenda is. And that's where we get the pushback, right? So giving them that option in a way where there's no parent agenda. And then you can have your own agenda on the side, right? Doing right. stuff that <laughs> you have control over. Right. And I think another way you can also say it is, you know, you really deserve extra support. Um, so I'd love to find someone who you can talk to and you feel comfortable with. Um, you know, and just making it seem like it's support for them. It's not about the fix it mode that you mentioned, you know, kids feel like so many times the ones that I work with, they feel like, um, people want them to be fixed. And so if you can kind of avoid that kind of feeling for your child, it can really help to get them in, in therapy and to talk to someone. Excellent. Yeah, and Madison, do you mind, um, stopping your screen share so we can yeah. see you better? Oh, sorry. I didn't realize okay. it was so Okay, um, so thank you for that answer. We have one last question. Um, my kids don't have any ideas that will help, just triggers we can avoid to not make it worse. So they're, the kids are focusing on avoiding the triggers instead of ways to make it better. Um, is there a way to generate new ideas to avoid being late? Mm, to avoid being late, like late to school. Yeah. Um, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, I think this is another one where it it can be helpful to sit down and think about, okay, what's what's my role and what's happening, right? How am I um, participating in them being linked to school, right? And trying to um, remove some of those ways that you might be supporting those ideas of how to avoid, right? Have you been going along with some of the things kids are asking for in order to avoid? So that's definitely a good step, I think. Um, I think this is really common too, right? Because parents are like, okay, let's come up with ideas. Let's generate ideas. Let's work on this together. They want to be collaborative. And kids are just like, no, <laughs> you don't understand. There's nothing else that can be done. Or they have ideas, but then those don't work, right? That's also really common. So I think that's a place to step back and focus maybe on those parents based strategies again. Um, sometimes that's a place where having those incentives and consequences in place can help kind of like move the needle on things. That can also be an alternative where it's like, okay, well, if you don't have ideas, I have some ideas about what we can implement. You might actually not like these as much as some of the ideas you could come up with. Mm -hmm. So I know that sounds a little adversarial, but it's sort of like um, giving them the option, right? Cause they can dig in their heels and say, no, I'm not participating in what you want me to participate in. It's like, okay, that's fine. I'm going to work on these things that I can over here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You could also say, I'm going to, I've got these ideas. You may or may not like them, but you know, it's, it's what the only thing I could think of. So um, yeah, just say I need your help here, but if you don't want to help, I got my ideas. All right. Yeah. Okay. Um, another question. We have a school plan where we offer specific support to our six-year-old in the morning. And if she's still unable to separate independently at the agreed upon time, the school counselor holds her back while she's hysterically screaming and crying desperately for me while I walk out. Is this traumatizing? Great question. This is so hard. I think this is like one of the number one things that keeps parents from being able to consistently implement these behavioral strategies, right? That are all about Oh, my kid has to experience anxiety. They have to experience this in order to learn that it's actually safe, that school is safe and that they're going to be okay. And I think there's a lot of more talk about the concept of trauma 
in our in our worlds these days too. So there's this fear in the pack, back of parents' head, like, am I negatively impacting my kid in some long-term way by doing this? And so I just want to like give kind of like a blanket reassurance. No, you are not traumatizing your kid by having them tolerate these situations where they're feeling really anxious, right? Negative emotions like this in these situations that are safe do not lead to long-term trauma responses, right? So trauma is all about being in a situation that is not safe and the emotions that come up in a, in a truly unsafe, scary situation, right? Um, but what we are actually doing by continuing to do that, that parent so strong, right? To continue to implement this plan every day, even though their kid is expressing a lot of anxiety, um, we're teaching them school is safe. It's safe and that's why I'm leaving. And if we do this enough, you will continue to learn that and the anxiety will go down. So just wanna say to that parent, you are doing the right thing. That sounds like a really sound plan to me from what you described. And um, yeah, no, not have putting your kid in a situation that causes them anxiety, if it is a safe situation, is not traumatizing. Yeah, and I'll just follow up by saying it is tough when you're leaving your kid who's screaming and crying and, you know, it, it hurts your heart, right? And just, um, you know, it sounds like you have a good relationship with that school counselor if you're working together to do that. So know that, you know, she's in a loving place and someone who cares about her getting through that and getting to school. And um, at the end of the day, you pick her up and you praise her for that. And oh my gosh, you're so strong. And um, you know, she'll get through it. It'll be much easier, especially at six, than coming back to her and creating that pattern. It's going to be much more difficult to interrupt. Yeah, that's another great point. Like if you are dealing with this when your kids are younger, that's actually like a really great time to do this, right? Because if it, if you're not addressing it when it's, when you actually can't hold them back, right? You have that option to kind of like physically keep them in the safe place that they need to be in. Um, yeah, that gets a lot harder when they're older. So way to go addressing it early. Yeah. And so I know like we're out of time, but I know there's so many situations and scenarios that we could be here for hours. Um, what about the late? Do you leave them at home? Do you, you know, what are the consequences? All of those things. So um, make sure that you really take heed of the books that were recommended. Um, reach out to, to Madison, specifically Seattle Children's like the earlier you can get the intervention, the better. And if you've got older kids, I noticed a lot of you do have the teens. Um, it's not like, oh my gosh, it's too late. I didn't do this when they were younger. Um, you can always work together to change those patterns and um, get them ready for the next phase of life if they are older. So um, don't feel like you're behind. It's never too late to, to get a handle on these things. So um, I really appreciate you being here tonight. Great, like specific action steps. I truly appreciate that. And I know the parents on here tonight did as well. Um, to know it's not your fault, parents, to know that you can do things even if your kid's not like in the middle of therapy or you know wanting to get that support yet, um, that you can start to make those changes. And then um, your child's gonna see, okay, there's changes being made and then they can come along for the ride. So thank you so much. I appreciate it. And all of you, before you leave, if you can just pop um, an aha moment or a thank you um, to our speaker for tonight, um, we'd really appreciate that. Um, and as always, I'm so glad that all of you took your time to be here. I know that your time is valuable. So to have you here with us is, is a privilege to be able to support you all. So good night, everyone. And we will see you for the next couple of parent chats.